Who am I? I am a child of God. We are children of God. If we remember the images of the universe known as the pillars of the earth, I can visualize the image that resembles a hand. This is the creative hand of my merciful God, our merciful God. It is wonderful to understand the time and dedication that went into creating every detail of who we are and how we function. As a child of God, I fall, I fall short in expressing the feelings that according to the Psalm 139, 14, says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderful made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well, this shows us that we are made in the image of God and are called for the reflect his image as his children. We were also created with a purpose in life. I can briefly recount my calling to ministry. During my childhood, my grandmother was my mentor. She taught me the importance of loving God above all things. Her guidance was very strict. Attending all church activities and to say no, it was not an option. It was mandatory to go to the church. I can briefly recall my calling also to ministry. During my childhood, my grandmother, like I say, it was a mentor for me. But from an early age, I felt drawn to the life dedicated to serving others. I continued to seek way to stay active in my faith. Attending church, even though I didn't understand the language, was not an excuse. I had to worship God. In 1998, I arrived at the United Methodist Church, and I knew I had found my place. And I praised the Lord. For two decades, I have served the Lord, and I believe He has a purpose for me. And I have simple say, call me. And I will go. As a Christians, we will always struggle with understanding God's purpose. But the scriptures provide us with answers that are both profound and simple. As taught in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40, the word of God says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? in the law, and Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the love and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And this passage guides us toward a deep, a straightforward understanding of our purpose. Brothers and sisters, let us remember that love is the foundation of our faith. And it is by love that God created us. Therefore, if we love God first, we will be able to love others. And that love is meant to be understood by all humanity. We are all children of God, as stated in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, God purpose is love. Let's love everyone. Let's love our neighbors. And our Lord Jesus Christ went to the extreme. Love and pray for your enemies. God purpose is love. Amen. Thank you, Leon.
you know. The sound people in the back are pretty happy because I haven't turned off my mic on them. <laughs> I'm so used to doing that in other churches, so it came naturally. So God is love. God has created us uh, to be people of love. But who am I? Who are you in the midst of that love? We also have to live in this world that's broken, that's challenging. Uh, it's not a kumbaya moment just because we're together. Churches struggle with relationships as well, right? It's real. So who am I in the midst of that love when maybe the world isn't perfect love? Here a reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 and 17. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know uh, him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything uh, old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Now, the setting of 2 Corinthians, if you remember the map from last week, if you were here watching online, you saw that there was uh, a number of places, uh, Thessalonica and Corinth and other places that Paul went around preaching and developing churches. Well, the church in Corinth, uh, this, this letter was intended for, um, was having troubles. It was having a lot of strife and infighting, and uh, it, it said that it's probably one of the most challenging churches that Paul and others had to deal with. They're having difficulties accepting Paul's leadership and others that came into leadership. They had entrenched beliefs and desires to do it their own way. They had an inability to shift to meet the times. Many refused in, in those early Corinth church to write, uh, to like their church on Facebook. Oh, wait, no, wait, that's something I dealt with as a district superintendent. <laughs> but Paul spends the early part of the, the, ch- of the book, of the letter, uh, writing and wrestling with the people of Corinth to understand him and the leaders that he sent. And we don't know for sure if Paul was the actual author, if this was just conveyed by others, but nonetheless, it was meant to help the church understand how to deal with one another in a better way. He was trying to get them as a team. Now, you're going to hear me say that a lot. Pastor Lino and I are a pastoral team. We're not going to just function solely as lead pastor associate. We're a team of pastors. The staff and I are a team in this together. We are a team of disciples of Jesus Christ. Working together, everyone called to do their part. But more than that, Paul was trying to help them understand a new way to live. New way of live just even outside of the church. He was saying that if we merely treat persons as katasarka, that's Greek, for from the flesh, if we only treat people as if the flesh, then it's going to be imperfect because we'd only be proclaiming Jesus by our lips. But it would also suggest that the transformative, uh, transformative resurrection of Jesus did not take place. He was saying we cannot just live the way we used to live. We are a new creation who am I? I am new in Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean? What does that look like? According to Paul, something changes in us at the time of our acceptance of Christ that we no longer live as we used to live. Our perspectives, our views, our understanding, and our evaluating everything around us changes, and we develop a new way of seeing, a new way of understanding, a new way of acting. Now, my journey of faith is a long one. I grew up as a a child of a pastor, and I was the perfect pastor's child. (laughs) My father's not here today, so I can say that. Oh, he might be watching. Sorry, Dad. I wasn't perfect, but as a pastor's kid uh, and just somebody who's a part of the church, I did everything in church. I did everything. I was always there, always doing something. I went to church. I participated as an usher. I sang in the choir. I did skits with my father in worship. I went to church camp, and I was even a high school delegate to general conference. So I was immersed fully into the church. But most of my life, the faith journey that I was involved in just had little molehills of of moments. I never had that mountaintop experience. I never had that deep valley where I needed God to pull me out. I believed in God, but I wasn't transformed. I wasn't new. That changed my junior year in high school. I had a friend named David. Now, David uh, was one of my best friends. He was a 
a big heavyweight wrestler, a uh, lineman on our football team, and he and I did musicals together. He was a lion in, in uh, 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 the... Uh, lion King? Lion, no, not the Lion King. What's that? Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Boy, I just, I just had a moment. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I was the Tin Man. I guess I got <laughs> no brain. I don't know. <laughs> That's... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Oh, is that the scarecrow? I don't know, whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, but So he was a great guy. But it was weird because he would never let me or any of his other friends go to his house. And at age 13 and 14, he was driving. He never quite understood that. He never really told us. So one day he said, Jeff, do you want to come over? I said, yeah, I'm sure. So I went over and I walked into his house. And there in the living room was a bed with medical devices. And there was his mother. She had been dying of cancer, and her, his father was in prison, and David was embarrassed about that, so he had to learn to drive to go get groceries. He didn't want to tell anybody. And I remember walking in there, and I just froze, and she said, it's okay, honey. I'm, you can't catch it. I went, that's not what I was scared about, but it was a pretty intense moment for me. It was a big surprise. Well, it was really coming to the end. That's why he wanted me to come there. But I was scheduled to go to uh, uh, church camp, uh, and so I wrestled with whether or not I should go, and I finally decided I would. So I went to Pine Lake Camp up in Wisconsin, right? And at night, there was always um, a, a devotion by Lakeside Campus, and that's it right there. So right there, we'd always go down, pray. There's a cross kind of hidden behind the middle there, overlooking the lake. And I remember sitting there, uh, and I put my hoodie over my uh, head because of mosquitoes, but also just because I wanted to kind of get away. And, I, and we were, someone was praying and they were singing, but I just kind of got quiet and I started to reflect on David and I was getting nervous about him. And I just felt this overwhelming sense of calm like I had never felt before, just at peace. And I went back to my bunk afterwards and just felt really okay. I didn't know what it was all about. And one of the counselors came in and said, Jeff, there's a phone call for you. So I went. And that's when my dad on the phone said, Dave's mom passed away. That day. It's the only time I've ever had that strong of an impulse of God's tender care for me. It was powerful. It was overwhelming. And then it was a few years, well, a number of years later, about 16 years later, I had gone out from my office to get, grab a bite to eat. And as I did... Um, I came back and the, the admin said, hey, somebody came here to see you, but you were gone, but he left this. A two by four. I'm like, what? What is it? And I asked who it was. She goes, he didn't leave a name, but it says this. At the time, the, ca the cabin that I was staying in was torn down, and somebody cut this piece and wrote, Jeff Bross, remember this, uh, the, when God filled your heart by the water and your friend's mom passed away? 1986, Pine Lake, July 17th. Left it for me. I don't know who it is. If somebody's watching and you did this, I want to know who you are. This is a beautiful gift. But that's my mountaintop experience. And I had it. And now with that powerful experience, you'd think I'd become perfect in love. But I still fail. I, I still live the way I was living in some respects. Maybe a little bit better, but not perfectly. And I still do, do to this day. I don't live a perfect life. I'm not a perfect Christian. I wish I was. But I fail, as we all do. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He forgives. And it, takes, uh, it took a child, though, to really convict me of trying harder to live a life that I claimed. Now, I started a church with a group of people called Flowing Grace, and we uh, rented in a school and they had a huge stage up front uh, in the auditorium. That's where we worshiped and went all the way around. And we, at the time, had about 50 or 60 little kids that were running around and part of our group. And uh, they were always in church. And so I came down for a children's message. And I came to sit down. I'd sit here. And they'd come up. And they'd sit with me up here. And some would go wherever. And they'd, but they'd rush because they always wanted to be the first kid to sit by me. So either side, they'd run to see who could get to me. It was a great way to get people to move fo forward with their kids because kids wanted to be near the front. But one little kid who's a wit boy came running up, sat beside me, scooted over next to me, and looked up at me and he said, I love Jesus. So now my pastor's heart is just going, bum, 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 bum. wow, that's exactly what you want. And I looked at him and I said, I love Jesus too. 
And he looked up at me kind of like, all right. And so I went with the children's sermon, and we did the service, and I was just like, oh, proud minister. Oh, <clears throat> we're making a difference in the life of our children. And his mom was there, and they had, she had three kids. <clears throat> One was a little bit older, him, and then a baby. I see her walking down, holding his hand with the baby, and the dad had the other child. And she came up, I smiled, I said, oh, your son just melted my heart. What a great thing that he says he loves Jesus. And she looked at me and said, Pastor Jeffrey. I said, yeah. She goes, well, he really wasn't telling you that. He was having snack time, and he said, I love Cheez-Its. By the way, Delenn, you outdid yourself. <laughs> you, you, when the service is over, I'm going to put this down. You've got to come up. She even did the top with the details. There, on the side are all the nutritional. This is nuts. <laughs> What's that? She's crackers. That's right. Anyway, so my, my bubble was kind of burst. I'm like, okay. So then a couple weeks later, I'm in uh, a grocery store. And I'm walking, and I hear from a distance, Pastor Jeffrey, Pastor Jeffrey! And I look, and there in a the cart standing up is the Whip Boy, going, Pastor Jeffrey! And his mom's there, and she's waving. They're too far away. I'm in line. So I just waved, and it's cool. I checked out, and I left. Sunday morning, I see them. She's got baby in hand. Her son in the other in the other hand, and she comes walking up and says, Oh, what a great thing to have, you know, happen at the grocery store. It was so touching and warm, you know, it just warmed my heart. You know, he waved to me. She goes, Pastor Jeffrey. I said, What? <laughs> she said, Well, as soon as he got done waving to you, she, he looked at me and said, Mom, I see God. <laughs> Meaning me. Now that's a weighty thing to be told. And I started to explain, uh, uh, well, no, not God, just Jeffrey. <laughs> but then I thought about it theologically. This four or five year old kid told me what I should be sharing with other people, which is I see God in you because of the way you act. Has anyone ever told you that because of you, they see the love of God. That's an awesome thing to have told to you. Because that's what we're called to be. We are called to be people of God. And Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are to be imitators of God. In us, people be, should be able to see the love of Christ, not because we're perfect, but because we care, because we love, because we're different than we would be than if we were followers of Jesus Christ. Your job as a disciple is to live so much in love that someone says, because of you, I see God. And you won't have to invite someone to church because they'll want to say, what makes you different? And you say, because I belong to a community of believers and I believe in Jesus, would you like to know what that's like? I know you'll go tell somebody, if you go to see a great movie, you'll call them and say, you should watch this movie. I know if you have a good meal at a restaurant, like the picnic basket, I just had a meal from there, mmm, delicious. And you had a real good experience, you tell them. You might even yelp about it, put it on the line. But for some reason, many of us are scared to share this love that we know that's different, not that we know any better. So what might you do differently so that people see in you the love of Jesus Christ? Micah 6, 8 tells us how we should live. Let's say it together. We should do justice love kindness and walk humbly and the rest of that in some other text would be walk humbly with god so let's say walk humbly with god let's say it one more time do justice love kindness and walk humbly with god and if we do that if we fully do that not just in the in the walls that are here but if we do that outside somebody will say to you you're different and i want that i want that inner peace i want all that kindness i want that love 
So when you leave today, you are to be Jesus to, uh, Jesus to the world. And we've got uh, bags of Cheez-Its that are going to be at the door. <laughs> we do. Take one, and every time you eat a Cheez-It, and you will forever now, this is ingrained in your head, I'm sorry. <laughs> every time you eat a Cheez-It, you're going to remember that you should be more like Jesus. And lastly, if someone ever in your life has been that to you, that you saw Jesus in them, reach out to them. Mr. Bice is mine. And I didn't tell him before he passed. And I regret it to this day. Let somebody you love know in you, I don't see a cracker. I see the love of Jesus Christ. Amen?